Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bijal Patel, and I'm the preparedness specialist for FEMA Region 2. On behalf of our team working to strengthen preparedness across Region 2, I'd like to welcome you to our preparedness webinar series today. So in FEMA's four-year strategic plan, the agency's number one goal is to build a culture of preparedness. The Region 2 Individual and Community Preparedness Program is focused on preparing individuals and communities for disasters by providing useful information and training, inspiring people to take action and be ready for any emergency. As part of this goal, we're pleased to be hosting today's webinar on how amateur radio can be a useful tool before, during, and after disasters. This webinar will provide guidance to emergency managers on establishing a viable NIMS compliant auxiliary communications program as part of your emergency operations plan. Our speaker today is John Garmendi. John is a 25-year volunteer member of the Middlesex County Office of Emergency Management in New Jersey. He currently serves as the Bureau Chief for the Auxiliary Emergency Communications Bureau. John is an extra class licensed amateur radio operator, N2DV. He is an accredited communications unit leader with the state of New Jersey. He's completed the DHS COMP, ITSL, and OXCOM communications training program. He is also a certified New Jersey emergency manager, number 155, and an instructor with the New Jersey Emergency Manager Project currently teaching the cyber curriculum. Professionally, John is a technology manager for a broadcast and AV electronics manufacturer. He holds an FCC general radio telephone license and was awarded two technical Emmy awards for his role in supporting the Salt Lake City and the London Olympic Games. So John, thank you for joining us today and I'll pass the mic over to you. Hey, good afternoon everyone in Region 2. I uh, appreciate everyone uh, taking the time to attend and appreciate everyone's interest in the subject. Um, uh, I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity as well to, to present. Um, so just a, just a quick overview of what I intend to present today. Um, and I think, you know, just wanted to, to mention that uh, um, Although it was uh, indicated that I'm a member of a couple of organizations, I'm, I want to make sure that everyone knows my opinions are my own. So I just wanted to state that up front. And let's take a look at what, uh, what we're going to go through today. There's a lot to cover. Um, but most importantly, the first thing I wanted to mention is that today's presentation is a resource awareness presentation for emergency managers and CERT team leaders. Um, and not necessarily a technical training. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Um, and then we're going to go through the, you know, the, the, the W's and the H, right, the four W's and the H. Um, what is amateur radio? Why should you include amateur radio in your emergency operations plan? Who are the amateur radio operators? Where can you find them? And how can you build a program? And then I'll give you some examples, and uh, we'll talk about some of the um, affiliated associations and some of the affiliated programs that are complementary to, uh, to emergency management, um, amateur communications, amateur radio communications. And we'll leave some time for, uh, for Q&A as well. So um, let's jump right in and take a look. So what is amateur radio? And amateur radio is a service that is, uh, was created and governed by the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. It requires a license to operate on assigned frequencies, and there are three classes of licenses with tiered privileges, meaning um, as you go up higher in license class, you gain access to, um, to more frequencies, and uh, different modes and more operating privileges. And the three classes of licenses are technician, general, and amateur, um, extra. Sorry about that. And as you go up in license class, the tests become a little bit more challenging. The good news is, and I think there's two pieces of good news here. Um, one is there's no, Morse code is no longer required. And I think in the past, that may have been a barrier to a lot of folks 
um, from getting their amateur radio license. You know, they could study the, the technical content, they could study some of the other stuff, but they just couldn't get down the code. So the good news is the FCC has abolished um, the need for any Morse code uh, testing whatsoever. The other piece of good news that you may not be aware is that the questions are the question pool are are openly published, meaning you can you can study the actual questions and answers for the test. I think, however, you know, in my opinion, you you do get more out of it if you understand the actual content. But regardless, um, it is possible to study the questions and pass the test. Um, in most instances, the technician class license, which is the lowest level and the easiest test, is all that's necessary to, uh, to, to be effective, right? Uh, what else is amateur radio? It's a community of, uh, of individuals with interest in technical aspects of radio communications. And I guess the last question is, and it's sort of the, you know, the same thing, it's like, um, is it still relevant? Is it really is, is amateur radio relevant to emergency management in, in, in 2020? Right? Uh, and I and I, I bring that up because I think a lot of people think, well, amateur radio. I, I used to have an uncle who did that, or somebody that I knew uh, a long time ago. Is that really a thing? We can communicate on cell phones, you know, around the world instantly with text messages and so on. And I say emphatically, absolutely yes. Emergency um, amateur radio is absolutely relevant to emergency management in 2020, and we'll, we'll talk about why. So as I said, amateur radio is a service, and this I took out of uh, Part 97 of the FCC regulations, and I don't, I don't like to read slides, but this is important. It says, when normal communication systems are not available, amateur stations may make transmissions necessary to provide essential communication needs in connection with the immediate safety, human life, and the immediate protection of property. So I think one of the big advantages, and I put it there in bold, is that having amateur radio um, operators involved in your emergency management program provides you access to a wide range of, of frequencies that are available only to amateur radio operators. We'll take a look at that in this slide here, right, and as I continue on with the why. Right? Um, so, and, and I think one of the themes through the presentation, as I said in the beginning, is that I want you to understand, amateur radio is a resource to you, the, uh, the CERT program manager or the emergency manager. Um, and, and one of the reasons why is, uh, as I mentioned, the broad range of operating frequencies and modes that amateur radio operators have available to them. And anyone who's maybe been involved in public safety radio communication or even commercial broadcast, you know, radio and television, knows the value of frequency spectrum and uh, the fact that, you know, the government auctions off part of the radio frequency spectrum for tons of money um, to commercial enterprises like cellular providers who go off and make a whole bunch of money by using those frequencies. Um, the good thing about amateur radio, like I say, is that they've got access to a broad range of frequencies and modes. And what, is that, what does that mean to you as an emergency manager? It means it gives you a lot of options um, to, to be able to communicate, to provide communications um, across the spectrum. And being across the spectrum, it gives you the opportunity to have both long-range and short-range communications. So again, it gives you options. So the resource provides you with options. Um, there are thousands of licensed amateurs in Region 2. And there's a robust uh, network of repeaters on multiple bands. And I took a look at one of the, one of the resources, repeaterbook.com, and uh, if you just did a quick search, and I saw that in New York State, there's 795 amateur radio repeaters. In New Jersey, there's 374. Um, Puerto Rico, there's 256. And in the Virgin Islands, there's five, three on St. Thomas and two on St. John. Now, they're not all um, – they're not all – open, although the majority of them are, and open means free for anyone to use, and uh, they're not all active at any one time. But again, just wanted to make an impression upon you to understand the potential resources that are available for you. 
They provide, amateur radio operators provide a reliable communications alternative in the event of a catastrophic failure. And another key point I think that you might want to think about as an emergency manager is that um, amateur radio provides opportunity for those in the AFN, you know, the access and functional needs community, to still participate in your program. Meaning, you know, if you've got someone with a disability that might prevent them from deploying to the field, they can still be very effective either at the EOC from their own home location. Uh, we in, uh, in Middlesex County happen to have a, a member of our ARIES group who lives in assistant, uh, assisted living facility. And um, that's a very valuable resource in that assisted living facility to have someone with radio equipment and the knowledge to operate it. So there's, there's a little bit of the why. So who are these people? Who are these amateur radio operators, right? Um, I, again, in my opinion, uh, my experience is that they're typically very self-sufficient. They own multiple radios. They spare batteries. They come with their own tools and the ability to uh, create expedient antennas, meaning you know, create antennas out of wire um, in the field and deploy them. Um, they have a MacGyver-like mindset, I always say. Um, they find a way to get things done. And um, many have self-contained go kits, you know, uh, pelican boxes or, or different kinds of equipment boxes uh, that are all set up with uh, power supplies and radios and so on. But they just need to, to, to plug into power and, and they can start communicating. They're very knowledgeable in a variety of technical disciplines. So not only do they understand the, the practical aspects of RF theory, but they are oftentimes very familiar with IP networking. Um, they understand radio programming, and they um, oftentimes are experienced in net control operations, meaning they can, um, they can handle uh, uh, information via radio in a communications environment very effectively and pass it along accurately from one point to another. And one very important point is they're really eager to serve. Let's take a look at possible areas where you, as an emergency manager um, or program manager, can recruit and find amateurs in your, in your jurisdiction or your community. Um, so you would look at local amateur radio clubs, and you can find those um, at, at the ARRL, ARRL.org. That's one of the links um, that were, was uh, provided as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about the ARRL, but local amateur radio clubs local amateur radio traffic handling nets. So generally, um, almost every night of the week, these nets come up on the local repeaters where they handle or practice handling traffic, information from one place to another. Um, QRZ.com, that's a great resource also in the, in the links. That is the database that's connected to the database, the FCC database. Actually, it's a worldwide database, but it's connected to the database and allows you to search by your um, county, by your municipality, state, zip code, so you can get a sense for um, who are the amateur radio operators in your jurisdiction, and maybe you can, you know, you can do an outreach to them and let them know our emergency management um, uh, group, bureau, you know, or, or department is seeking to establish a program, and you can go that way. Uh, take a look within your own CERT programs. Take a look at maker spaces where a lot of a lot of young folks are gathering to uh, to experiment with technology and talk technology. So a lot of a lot of activity around STEM, and that's maybe a way to bring in some of the younger people into a program. Um, you can promote your program at regional ham fests. And hams, amateur radio operators get together at these ham fests. Um, they're basically amateur radio equipment uh, swap meets, right? So you can you can promote your program there. Uh, you can sponsor a ham cram, which is either a one-day or a half-day uh, kind of uh, amateur radio study boot camp, licensed boot camp, that ends up, uh, you know, the end, end of the day uh, has a testing session, and then you've just created your own little pool of, um, of licensed amateur radio operators. And you can also take a look at um, um, organizations that have a communications component and uh, and. Uh, like the Civil Air Patrol or the Coast Guard Auxiliary, where the, they have their own comms programs. They have people who are knowledgeable in communications. Uh, let's talk about some examples now. Um, one that I always like to point out 
is the um, Hurricane Maria Puerto Rico deployment in September of 2017. Right? The Red Cross reached out to the ARRL. Again, I mentioned before, it's the Amateur Radio Relay League, which is the uh, essentially the largest organization of amateur radio operators. It's not the governing body. That's the FCC. Those are the guys that tell you what what you can do on what frequencies. But the ARRL is, you know, just a kind of a um, um, an, an organization uh, that has some structure and represents amateur radio operators. So the ARRL, uh, Red Cross reached out to the ARRL um, because they had a need for amateur radio operators on the island um, in the um, in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. Um, one of the bullets there that I put that I think is key is that you know they had a previously executed MOU in place. And that's important, right? Because in uh, one of the sayings in emergency management is, you know, um, the time to be handing out your, your business cards is not when the towers are coming down, right? You've got to have those relationships and those agreements in place beforehand. And that's important. That's why I, I put that there specifically. Uh, I think that's part of why this was a success. Three days later, three days after the request went in, 22 volunteers deployed to the island, and the ARRL supplied a cache of radio go kits through a program that they call Ham Aid. I'll talk a little bit more about. So, um, who went? 22 hams from 17 states, ages from 19 to 72. Again, just it gives you an idea of the resource pool that's out there. Uh, where do they go? They went to the Joint Field Office, the EOC, hospitals, fire stations, shelters. How long did they stay? The, the bulk of them stayed for about three weeks. There are others. I personally know a guy who stayed for, for longer. But, um, you know, what did they do? They handled safe and well messages for families looking to see if their loved ones made it through the storm, resource requests, medical evacuation communications, and all kinds of military, federal, and... Hey, military. are you on the ICPD call? Um, they, they, uh, they provided tech support. Right? They fixed My all kinds of stuff. Shows they sent out a canceled I, one, but then um, they had sent out a some, new one at the same time. Someone, sounds like I had both of them on my calendar. I'm, I'm sorry. Debbie, is that you? Okay. Apologies. Um, continue on. Um, so, like I said, they, they handled those kinds of communications and provided technical support on the island. Were there lessons learned? Absolutely. You know, there always are, right? And there's an, a, a pretty lengthy after-action report that you can go up and take a look at um, that talks about what worked, what didn't, and the lessons learned, right, as with any incident. Um, you know, I apologize in advance. I know this is a FEMA Region 2 presentation, but I, I'm from New Jersey, and this is an adaptation of a presentation that I've done before for the New Jersey Emergency Preparedness um, Association. But just, again, to give you an idea, Right. So um, in New Jersey, there are over 15,000 licensed amateur radio operators. There are 71 affiliated um, ARRL clubs in the state. There's a very robust repeater network throughout the state. And there's a very active ARES program. ARES is A-R-E-S, Amateur Radio Emergency Service Program, and it's um, split southern New Jersey and northern New Jersey. Right. Uh, when I wrote this, there were about 374 registered members, but I bet you it's up to about 500 members now. And um, these HAMs, these amateur radio operators, provided valuable support to their served agencies for disasters, like Sandy, Hurricane Sandy, as well as planned events. And I'll talk about the papal visit in a minute. But I think that's a key point as well. Amateur radio operators, you can use them not just for disasters, right? You can use them in planned events. So talk a little bit about the papal visit and the World Meeting of Families in uh, 2015. Um, it was run by the uh, Southern New Jersey Aries Group and the Gloucester County Amateur Radio Club. They provided communication support to the Cooper Union Medical um, Center and the MCC South for both events. They were an integral part of the comms planning process, and I think that's important, that if you, if you, you, know, if you create these programs, include, include these guys in your in, in, in your planning meetings, right? Um, um, the, southern, the Southern New Jersey group um, built and deployed these pod runner go kits that they used during this event. And they had, uh, they didn't create specifically for this event, but they had already in place what they call the CERN, the Southern Counties Emergency Radio Network. And it's based on a, a type of uh, digital communication that amateur radio operators use uh, called uh, Yezu Fusion as their backbone. 
Um, here's a, here's a, a couple of pictures of these uh, these uh, Pod Runner pods, and you can see they're self-contained amateur radio, large amateur radio go kits, multiple radios across multiple frequencies, multiple antennas, and you see the one on the left is kind of deployed in a, in a standalone configuration where the scissor jack is down with the wheels. And on the right side, you can see the picture there of the um, of the uh, pod runner mounted on a trailer hitch onto a truck. And you can see some field deployable antennas there in the in the fore, uh, foreground as well. Um, so establishing a program framework, right? This is this is very important. You know, I think you need to have some structure around a program if you're going to create it. Um, should have clearly identified roles, including you know uh, someone has to be the leader, so everybody knows um, you know who does what and, and who's kind of in, in charge. Um, I would establish you know again these are my recommendations, but I would establish a minimum number of hours per year or per quarter. Um, nothing overwhelming, right? Because the likelihood is that a lot of these people are going to be volunteers, but have some minimums and have them report their hours via an ICS 214. Right, for two reasons. One, you want to keep track of their hours because you need to show those um, when you when you want to go for funding and have some substantiation behind it. And number two, it gets the people in the program used to using ICS forms, right, which is important. Um, establish some minimum trading requirements. You know, have the, the ICS basics, 100, 200, 700, 800. And also, I think um, more and more uh, as a as 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 a must. Right, where where practical is uh, have your folks go through the AUXCOM program, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit. I would emphasize the commitment, right, because that's what's going to separate this program from a ham radio club, right? You wanna you wanna sort of eliminate some of the casual maybe aspect of it, and and let people know, hey, you know, this is a commitment. If you're not committed, maybe it's not for you. And I would do some formal vetting, right? You know, check, do some background check. Um, you know, maybe the same as you would do for any other member of uh, an emergency management team, you know, and some of the other ESFs. Uh, check their references and, you know, have a look at their social media. And if there's something that uh, uh, you need to look at a little more closely, you can ask them about it, right? And then have a probationary period with review, right? You don't want somebody who just joins but doesn't participate. Um, so now I'm going to talk about some of the... Um, some of the different structures and some of the different um, uh, affiliated types of programs that would be complementary to your program. So the first thing is RACES. Right? RACES has been around for a long time, and it stands for Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service. It comes out of the old civil defense, and it's a, a federal service that's established under the FCC Part 97, which is the same part of the FCC rules that um, regulates all amateur radio. Um, a RACES group must be sponsored by, you know, and these are the words they use, a civil defense organization. So obviously an emergency management program, whether it's uh, town or county or state, would qualify. They're generally activated, and it's an important distinction, generally activated only during the response phase. So um, not typically not you're not able to deploy RACES during a planned event, such as parade or walkathon or, you know, stuff like that. Um, Activation is limited to disasters, and there are actually limitations in the Part 97 rules on the number of hours per month that, the, that you can practice. It's limited to one hour a week, um, and you can do two 72-hour uh, drills. I see that there's a, there's a typo there. I forgot to put the times two, but it's up to it's up to two 72-hour drills per year. That's so that's races. Um, ARIES, which is uh, sponsored by the organization I spoke about before, the ARRL, is the Amateur Radio Emergency Service, and it's created by the ARRL. They have a formal field structure, so uh, meaning there's a section emergency coordinator, which in New Jersey spans multiple counties. Um, in some other states, they have one SEC for the whole uh, for the whole state, or they have um, you know, even more SECs, but. Section emergency coordinator is kind of the top at the, the local level. Then there's the DEC, the district emergency coordinator, which, again, in New Jersey, kind of aligns to the county level. And then there's the emergency coordinators, which are uh, aligned to the municipality or the township. Um, ARIES program is currently undergoing a program update, uh, basically as a result of some lessons learned. 
uh, have some new training requirements. Uh, there's a volunteer management uh, uh, program in place with a skills database, and there's some online training that uh, that you can take the EC-001, and then the advanced, uh, which is the management program, which is the EC-016. Links to both of those in the links. Um, Ares has MOUs, Memorandums of Understanding with FEMA, the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, and the National Weather Service. And a key distinction, again, is that Ares is not limited to emergencies. So an Ares group can support parades, marathons, you know, stuff like that, planned events. You know, one thing that we do in Middlesex County, where I'm from, is we have a combined Ares and Racies program. So uh, I'm the bureau chief for Middlesex County Foxcom program, which covers the area, uh, the racy side, and my deputy is the um, section emergency coordinator for northern New Jersey. So we have a combined program, so we're covered for, for both disasters and planned events. Um, Oxcom. I mentioned Oxcom as part of the training that I think is uh, is is men is is it's it's not mandatory, but I consider it as very important, and I'll tell you some reasons why. And Oxcom was recreated by Department of Homeland Security Office of Emergency Communications. Uh, previously, it was the the OEC uh, was its own thing. Now the OEC is a division under the CISA, CISA, which is the Cyber Infrastructure um, Security Authority, right? And Oxcom is now a uh, position in the COMU, the communications unit, in the typical ICS structure, so um, and reports to the COMEL. And it's typically indicated as a technical specialist position. And um, I think the communications, the Office of Emergency Communications is uh, working to establish OXCOM as a formal ICS position in and of itself. OXCOM, the training program, so that's OXCOM the position. The OXCOM, the training program, is a 20-hour, uh, two-day program. It generally occurs over a long weekend. So, it's, so uh, the ones that I've been to in New Jersey have been full Saturday, full Sunday. And that's how you get your 20 hours. Um, uh, it provides radio operators with a solid foundation in an understanding of where they fit in the COMU. And it, it goes over a lot of the uh, COMS-related ICS principles and the tools, the forms, the 215, 205, two, uh, the 201, uh, 213 message form, 214 activity log, all that stuff, right? It teaches the volunteers how to act, and you know, in quotes, in the EOC and in field deployments, right? Because, um, again, as I mentioned before, you really want to try to eliminate that casual aspect of the program. And you also, what you also absolutely do not want is some guy showing up in an orange vest with five radios saying, I'm here to help right, at your incident. Nobody wants that, and that's not what we want to promote as, as the right way to incorporate that resource into your program, right? So it, it just gives the volunteer the, the understanding that, hey, you know, you're a volunteer, but that, you know, volunteer is, is not, um, does not mean you're not professional, in the same way that, you know, just because you're paid doesn't mean you're professional, right? So volunteer doesn't equate to amateur and, um, you know, and vice versa. So I think that's, that's one of the things that the program drives home as well. Hey, you're an important resource. Um, kind of act like it, right? Um, some, of the, some of the prerequisites are you need a, license, a radio license to participate. You need to have 100, 200, 700, 800. And it also teaches the volunteers the common language of emergency management so that when they're in the EOC or when they're deployed in the field, um, they're talking the same language as all of the professionals. Um, in my opinion, this is the future. And OXCOM moving forward is becoming an umbrella for all you know, amateur uh, radio immune, emergency communications moving forward. And to point that out, um, I added the bullet there that in July 2016, Colorado uh, under, under Colorado law, they created an actual OXCOM unit for the Department of Homeland Security in, within Colorado. So well, that's OXCOM. Where does it fit? So I think everybody who's, uh, who's got any um, um, ICS training un, under their belt understands uh, the COMU is, in, is under logistics. COMEL is kind of the boss of, of the, of the COMU, right? So the COMU is communications unit. 
ComL is the comms unit leader. Um, and then the other positions report up to the ComL. Um, I do need to maybe make a correction, right? So ITSL, which is the IT specialist position, that is actually its own box now. And that position is actually a peer to the ComL. So I have to make note of that. But this is where AUXCOM, gives you an idea of where AUXCOM fits, right? reporting up to the comms unit leader. Uh, so the affiliated programs, right? There's something called Skywarn. That's a National Weather Service uh, program um, that trains volunteer weather observers. It provides ground truth and hyper-local weather reports back to the local weather offices. Uh, a majority, although it's not a requirement, but the reason why I put it in the presentation is because a majority, oftentimes, majority of the weather observers are also amateur radio operators. So there's there's some synergies there that you could maybe work into your uh, program, like, you know, we did in Middlesex County, we hosted a Skywarn training program, right? Um, so as I said, the Skywarn coordinator should be part of your OXCOM team. And at least in New Jersey, I know at one time Mount Holly um, weather uh, had maintained an amateur radio station. And I'm not sure about Upton or some of the other offices within the FEMA region, too. Um, National Hurricane Center, they have their program, right? Um, they have a station, uh, WX4NHC. Uh, they established the Hurricane Watch Net. And again, this is kind of an affiliated sort of complementary program where uh, whenever a hurricane is within 300 miles of, of landfall of the United States and its territories, um, they activate the Hurricane Watch Net where they communicate via a, um, HF amateur radio or uh, voice over IP, okay, uh, and they, they start up this weather net. And again, uh, handle health and, and safety, um, health and welfare traffic. And uh, at the uh, National Hurricane Conference in March, there's usually an entire day dedicated to, uh, to amateur radio. Uh, MARS. So MARS is the military auxiliary radio system, and they've kind of uh, been working on um, – reinventing themselves as well. So, so Mars, um, those of you who are old enough would, would uh, maybe remember, like in Vietnam, Mars was used to get um, messages back to the service people's, uh, the service person's family back in the United States, and they do so via things they called radio, uh, radio patches, phone patches. So they'd connect a phone to a radio, and then it would, you'd be able to make a call. Now they are really a uh, – they're, they're sp sponsored by the Department of Defense, and they provide contingency communication support to the U.S. Army and the Air Force, uh, primarily an HF mission. And I didn't – you know, I said this one's going to be a technical presentation, but just so you know, uh, as I said earlier on, there's a whole bunch of frequencies available to use. And one of the things about HF is that it provides you the ability to do long-range communication. Um, but generally, just remember that – the lower the frequency, the larger the antenna. That's that's just a general guideline. Um, they do an annual cross band, what they call a cross band test, where active duty military um, um, communicate with amateurs on amateur frequencies, and they do frequent training nets. So a lot of training goes on in in Mars. Like I said, their mission is is evolving. Saturn. That's the Salvation Army Team Emergency Radio Network. Their mission is to create a, and maintain a trained pool of volunteer personnel to provide emergency communication support to the Salvation Army during disasters. And they have a regional structure. In the U.S., it's the Central, Eastern, Southern, and Western. They really embrace the digital modes for efficient traffic handling. And I didn't um, spend a lot of time talking about modes, but amateur radio operators, not only do they have access to multiple frequencies, they have different ways they can communicate on those frequencies. So your amateur radio operators have the ability to use analog voice okay, um, or digital voice. And um, on those, uh, in those digital modes, they're able to, uh, uh, to communicate digitally using or sending things like email, like ICS forms, and so on. And Saturn has embraced uh, the digital modes for efficient traffic handling. So transferring messages, especially if it's um, information of a, a medical nature, 
right? Like uh, the long names of, of some drugs and medicines where the potential for a mistake could be devastating are better handled by the digital modes than analog voice. Uh, let's see. Yep. Oh, here we go. Digital modes. Okay. So the digital modes, and I, and I, you know, put a little humor here, right? It's not your grandfather's ham, right? So it's not this guy just talking on a microphone um, as in the old days, right? Um, they, they embrace, and in, in many instances, in some instances, actually lead the adoption of digital forms of communication. And as I said, data voice and even video. And some manufacturers in the amateur radio or the public safety communications hardware realm um, have some specific, uh, specific uh, formats that they manufacture hardware for, like ICOM uses something called, or has something called D-Star. Yezu has something called Fusion. And then there's sort of a generic thing that's really taken on right now is DMR. Um, and it's a generic version of Moto Turbo, of Motorola's Moto Turbo. And as I said before, there's several tools for the transmission of data. Um, FL Digi, there's narrowband emergency messaging system. There's something that's really, um, I think, uh, coming up now and, and becoming very popular, which is WinLink. And it's essentially email over radio software. As I said before, several utilize um, you know, pre-canned fillable ICS forms that make the uh, the 213 messaging um, communication, very simple and easy. And then there's also something that's a, kind of an older technology that's been around for a while, but still very useful, which is APRS. Uh, it's automatic position reporting. It's kind of a, uh, kind of a GPS uh, in reverse, where you can tell where that radio is. So it's good for, uh, if you're doing search and rescue, you know, someone's uh, out in the field with APRS, you can tell Uh, broadband mesh networking. Now, I, I mentioned it way in the beginning when I talked about the frequencies that are available. I specifically said they've got privileges, amateurs have privileges on 2.5 and 5 gigahertz. And those frequencies might be familiar to some of you because that's where your home routers, uh, your home Wi-Fi routers operate as well. But the thing about amateur radio operators are that they don't have the limitations that you do in terms of power or antennas or distance. So they've uh, they've taken advantage of these frequencies and the ability to uh, to operate at higher power and longer distances and created something called um, broadband mesh networking and um, they they've created uh, or have the potential to create a robust redundant and self-healing mesh network where um, there are multiple paths for the information to, to travel. And if one of them is, is broken, an alternate route is found, and the, and the information still gets to it, its intended destination. Um, uh, it uses low-cost and reliable off-the-shelf commercial infrastructure, right? Um, so it's readily available. And um, just one example, there's many, uh, including you know, some implementations here in New Jersey. But uh, the Orange County uh, California Racies used it to provide um, uh, communications, uh, you know, uh, receive and transmit video back to the uh, Orange County Sheriff for a uh, for a large planned event, um, and the organization um, that's kind of developing the standards under that are is called Arden, the Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network. So, as as a program manager or an emergency manager, how much is all this going to cost me? Right, I, you probably know. You're involved in public safety radio communications. There's, you know, millions of dollars is not uncommon to put up a, uh, a trunked or a digital uh, communication system, right? Um, you can really get into, uh, uh, get yourself an amateur radio station for as little as like 600 bucks. Um, a decent dual band, meaning UHF, VHF radio, power supply, some coax, and an antenna. And uh, you can put, you know, you can put this station in your EOC. If you wanted to add HF, I'd say it's probably another $1,500 or so. Manufacturers sometimes, sometimes subsidize. Yezu has been on in the past to, because they wanted to establish their um, fusion format, they made fusion repeaters available like ridiculously cheap. Um, the grants are available. And uh, sometimes, and is it possible to repurpose some of your old analog land mobile radios 
you know, maybe um, if, if you're an emergency management uh, agency and the county within which you reside or the state that you're a part of um, has just gone through a digital upgrade, there might be a lot of, uh, um, of uh, old analog radios on the UHF band, most likely, that can be reprogrammed to be used on amateur bands. So that's also a possibility. Uh, so maintaining your program. I think this is either the last slide or next to the last slide, right? Uh, develop an esprit de corps, right? Make sure that you've got monthly meetings. Have work parties. Trust them, right? If you've vetted the people already and, and you know, you trust the process, then you've got to have some trust in the team, right? Allow them to develop relationships with the other members of your staff. Let them know who the COM Ls, the COM Ts are. Who's the CERT coordinator? Now, that's important, as I said before. It's important to have the relationships in place before any kind of deployments. Uh, include them in the planning process, right? Make sure your EOP reflects this resource. And recognize them, you know, every once in a while. Let them know they're doing a great job. Get challenge coins, make certificates, buy them a pizza, right? That kind of stuff goes a long way with the amateurs. Um, uh, support opportunities for exercises, right? So. Uh, the ARRL sponsors this thing they call Field Day, and it's generally the last full weekend in June where amateur radio operators go out into the field with generators, solar power, batteries, and so on, and simulate emergency conditions. And they put antennas up in the trees, or you know, they'll, they'll bring out their portable stuff. And it's a good way to test your stuff and make sure it works. Incorporate them into planned events, like I said, bike races, marathon, your town day, stuff like that. And have some uh, cross-training with your CERT group, right? Um, uh, have the HAMS conduct the, uh, the radio training and, and the license classes for their own CERT members. It, 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 uh, it goes a long way. Uh, and with that, we're, we're at the last slide and have some time for Q&A, probably not enough for all, the, um, for all the questions here. Turn it back over to, uh, to Debbie or to, to Bibi. And See what we can get through in the remaining time. But I hope everyone got something out of this, and I hope everyone uh, at least walks away with this knowing that you don't have it as part of your EOP. You really should take a look at, um, at this valuable resource, and I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much for this very valuable information, John. Sure, Debbie. We we, we do have a number of questions for you, and we will just get through as many of them as we can. So okay. the first question is, how do you determine which frequencies and modes are appropriate? Okay, good question. So uh, when I spoke about repeaters before, which, by the way, a repeater is, 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 a, is, is a device, is a radio, that um, allows you to uh, extend the range right, of your UHF and VHF, mostly UHF and VHF. And UHF and VHF with a repeater is something you generally use within within your town or within your county, right? That's and depending on the size of a county, right? But um, UHF and VHF are for typically short to mid-range communications, whereas the lower frequencies, HF, um, are generally for the longer range communications. And then um, you even have to look at what time of day it is it. Right? So some of the lower frequencies perform better in the evening, and some of the higher HF frequencies perform better in the daytime. Right? Again, I said it wasn't going to be a technical presentation, so I think it's outside the scope, but hopefully that gives you an idea. No, that's great. Thank you. Sure. Are you seeing a transition? I'm seeing oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I think you're going to ask me if I'm seeing the questions. Go ahead. Are you seeing a transition from analog link repeater systems in New Jersey used by Aries, et cetera, to cover DMR, over to DMR? Um, it's, it's really still in the beginning. It's not a wholesale adoption just yet because there are so many analog repeaters still out there. Um, I, am seeing, um, I am seeing some, uh, some programs starting to put up um, – Hybrid repeaters that are both that can both that can do both um, analog and digital, such as uh, fusion. Some of the fusion repeaters, um, and there's also uh, some other methodologies for creating a, uh, a hybrid setup. 
Um, but yeah, there are, I, I don't think, what I don't see is people taking down analog repeaters and putting up digital ones. What I do see, especially with DMR, is people putting up additional DMR repeaters. That I am seeing. Understood. What was uh, ARRL's ham aid program all about? We have a listener who's a new amateur radio operator looking to get properly equipped for community emergencies and was wondering if you had any advice for them. Sure. Um, I think the best thing to do is just Google uh, ARRL, Amateur Radio Relay League, ham aid, and you'll see. But the one thing I can tell you is the program is not a – what they don't do is give you equipment to keep – forever right so they're not they're not a, you know they're not a granting you know they don't grant equipment out what they do have is they maintain a pool of um, equipment ready to go to support um, areas that have been um, affected or impacted by a disaster so it's basically my understanding you know I'm not an ARRL representative but my understanding is that it's a short-term a loan program that allows you to uh, to have access to additional communications resources for the duration of uh, response and recovery, let's say. A great opportunity. Uh, we have a listener who um, works in a private residential only community with an established emergency preparedness group. Uh, his question is about the minimum number of ham radio operators in a community of about 1,900 residents, would you recommend? Gosh, that's um, that's uh, I don't know. You know what? That's that's a tough one. That's a that's something I I haven't really looked at. Um, so asking not how many do I think there are, but how many should there be within a yes. uh, a community yeah. of 1,900? I yeah. honestly I think it depends more on the um. The, the 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 physical size of the community, you know, the acreage, right? So how how vast is that housing community? Um, you know, I, I assume it's a it's a development and not a not not an apartment building. So a housing community, I, I think it depends more on the geography than the amount of people within it. So I don't know if that okay. answers the question, but I I think that's a, a better way or a different way of looking at it. Look at it. So you may have already um, answered this in your presentation. I'm just kind of going through the questions in order, but um, where does the ham radio get the resources for the equipment and who supports the financial end of repeaters and the maintenance that they need to operate? Good question. Good question. So um, there's a number of ways, right? As I said, most amateur radio operators um, um, are self-sufficient. They come with their own radios, um, and many amateur radio clubs are, are formed around repeaters, right? So, um, so the funding uh, the funding comes in a number of ways. It comes from club dues. It comes from um, grants. It comes from sponsoring organizations, and uh, oftentimes uh, space on towers is uh, is also a very valuable commodity. But it's often donated because of the public service that hams provide. But if you are establishing a um, an, an AUXCOM program, or a RACES program that is, uh, is directly tied to your Office of Emergency Management, right? Um, generally, that Office of Emergency Management will provide the radios and the funding to keep the, the repeater going. Now, obviously, we're talking to a wide audience here. Um, I would say that most likely at the municipality level, it's harder to get the municipality to provide funding, whereas maybe at the county level, a little bit easier. And again, there are grants, you know, um, you know all kinds of grants available that uh, you should speak with your, uh, your uh, served agency about and, and put a plan together, you know, go, go to the, go to the emergency manager and say, Hey, um, I'd like to get this. Here's my plan for the next three years. Here's how much it'll cost. And then they can incorporate that in part of their planning and their budget and what they go ask for. Great suggestion. Where would somebody get OXCOM training? Okay. The OXCOM program is generally administered, right? And um, 
uh, I'm not, maybe not in every instance, but I'm pretty sure that in Region 2, the OXCOM programs are generally administered by the, um, what we call the SWIC, the S-W-I-C, and that is your statewide interoperability coordinator. I know there's one for New York. I know there's one for New Jersey. Um, I assume there's one for Puerto Rico, and, and I don't know. Um, you know, I don't, if Chris Tuttle is on this call, he could answer the question. But uh, generally, it's administered all training in the COM program, like, um, uh, uh, like, like COM-T, COM-L, ITSL. All those programs are generally uh, managed by your statewide interoperability coordinator. And he works with the DHS uh, CISA, Office of Emergency Communications, to schedule those classes. And they send um, uh, trainers to, uh, to come in and do the program. So I would start with my SWIC, my Statewide Interoperability Coordinator for your state. You could also look on the uh, CISA, C-I-S-A, Office of Emergency Communications Division website and see if there's a schedule of any upcoming AUXCOM um, classes. I know that um, I spoke before about ham fests, and the biggest one um, annually is in Dayton, Ohio, or near Dayton, Ohio. And um, not this year because we didn't have one because of COVID, but two years ago um, Aux, there was an AUXCOM class um, at the Dayton, Ohio ham fest. So that's another possible um, another possible place to take a look for OXCOM training. Tom, did you say during COVID-19 um, whether or not that training would be made available in a virtual environment? Or I did not say that. Did? No, no, I don't. Could you, uh, I don't. Could you speak to that? I can't. I'm, I I okay. I I can't because um, uh, I don't think that it's been delivered. I. I, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not the SWIC for New, for New Jersey, so I want to be very careful. But to the okay. best of my knowledge, Oxcom. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, Oxcom has not been delivered online. Um, I know that there were some Oxcom training for New Jersey that had been planned before COVID, but it has been postponed. All other in-person comms training in this state, as far as I know. Okay. That, that was just a question from another listener, um, although we have some people writing in the chat that it will be virtual in 2021, so I guess oh, we'll, we'll, we'll wait and see, right? That's great. That's great, yeah. How does or where does Echo Link fit into the whole scheme of things? Ah, okay, good question. So Echo Link is, um, is a uh, – I would, I would put that under the, the – the, uh, the definition or, or an example of um, what I would call ROIP, right, radio over IP. So Echo Link um, allows you through an IP device, whether it's your cell phone or your laptop, your computer, to connect to what they call a node, and then the node uh, will connect to a repeater. So it actually allows you to a couple, two forms of communication. So you can communicate via a device, whatever, right, your phone or or laptop, anything that can get on a network. You connect to the node and then the Echo Link node, and, and then the Echo Link node is connected to your repeater. And um, you can facilitate. So somebody can be on a radio in the field. You can be on an IP-based device. So that's where Echo Link uh, falls kind of a hybrid solution, or what I would call radio override. Yeah, that's an excellent solution. Can, uh, do you happen to know, do our ham repeaters, um, would they be considered critical facilities, or ham operators considered, you know, essential personnel? Hmm. Uh, I don't know. I think that, I think that would, I think that would be up to your um, AHJ, your authority having jurisdiction. So if you are uh, you're an amateur radio operator who is um, part of a formal AUXCOM program, 
that's under the authority of an OEM or you know some other agency, then perhaps you could be considered essential. Although I don't, I don't want to give anybody false uh, guidance on that one. Okay. What do you think would be the best way to incorporate amateur radio operators in a virtual or enhanced EOC? So, um, so I think that could kind of be in a, a hybrid-like uh, scenario as well. So if you've got an amateur radio operator uh, at home, again, most of these people are pretty self-sufficient, so there's high likelihood that they've got it in their car, they've got handheld radios, and they've probably got a setup at their house. So they've got their radio, they've got their antenna, they're able to, by radio, get onto a repeater or not, you know, communicate with, with other people directly, other amateurs. Um, and then if they're part of your, uh, they're part of your virtual EOC and they have access through, you know, whatever you're using, whether it's VOC or Teams or, uh, you know, Web EOC, um, then they've got that running on their laptop. And I guess they'd be able to incorporate, um, you know, handle messages that you send them via uh, the computer and they can put out over, over, over radio and communicate to amateurs wherever they are. That's just one scenario. Um, I don't know. I, what I don't know is in a virtual EOC, is there the ability to incorporate directly, so again, a radio over IP kind of, um, to incorporate amateur radio connectivity directly or not, like kind of a mutual link type of thing. I don't know if that's that's possible. Probably is, but maybe you wouldn't want that, right? Maybe maybe one of the one of the good things I didn't mention this, but you know, like there's less vulnerability to um, amateur radio communications uh, with respect to cyber. You know, there, there's no site. Well, I wouldn't say there's no right because as they move into digital realm, become an IoT component as well and vulnerable. But analog amateur radio and analog amateur radio repeaters are less susceptible to cyber vulnerabilities. I would say that. Okay. I know there's, um, we're running out of, I, I, I see the question still coming in. I can answer a couple really quickly. So Steve asks, what's the SET, the SET, that's the simulated emergency test that generally happens each uh, October, early in October. Um, and again, it's just a, a way to, um, uh, to test your amateur radio capabilities under a, uh, a scenario with injects and stuff like that. So I see that's, that's one that popped up here on the screen. Um, and John, I'm going to ask you just one last question. Uh, sure. It is 359. Yep. There, and just so that our listeners know, there is a download pod on your screen, which would allow you to download a PDF of uh, today's presentation. We've also moved over a very short three-question poll. If folks wouldn't mind just taking a minute to answer those three questions, it really does help us to drive our future webinar programming. Um, but the last question that I had for you was, how would someone go about acquiring a HAM license during COVID-19? OK, uh, good question. So um, there are a number of uh, amateur radio groups who are sponsoring both uh, virtual testing, OK, um, where, you know, similar to the way you'd, you'd take a college course virtually and they give you the midterm and the, and the final. You know, there's mechanisms for virtual testing. And you have to have your desk completely clear, no notes and all that stuff. Or there are other organizations, amateur radio clubs, who are hosting, um, uh, I guess, socially responsible amateur radio testing. And they're doing it uh, where people stay in their cars and they hand you the test and you take the test and they take the test away from you and they grade it, do it that way. Um, so there's a number of ways to still test for your amateur radio license uh, in the age of COVID and to do so safely. 